Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Reggie Brooks webinar series. I am your host this evening. My name is Reggie Brooks, and I'm also your speaker this evening, and today's going to be a very special session. We're going to talk about government programs. All over the country when I travel, people are always coming up to me, and they're asking me all these questions about government programs. How do I get them? Are they really true? Uh, can you really make money? How does a, uh, uh, the entitlement system actually work? How is it that it can be a win-win deal when the government is giving away money for free? And so I hope to answer all these questions and also give you every single reason for, to go forward, move forward with government programs and incorporate government programs in your investing. So very important. And as I go on, you're going to understand and, and see the reasons why. Now, I know that uh, some of you have gotten government programs before. And I've certainly gotten a bunch. Uh, I have students that have gotten a bunch. If you have not gotten government programs in the past, um, hopefully you'll learn something this evening that's going to spark your imagination and have you go after some of these government programs. Now, uh, before I get started, I think I should take just a moment and give you a little brief bio on myself as to who I am. And many of you may be on this call and you don't know who I am. Some of you, of course, are my students, long-term students, and you do know me. But for those of you that don't, my name is Reggie Brooks. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and I was raised by a single mom. And you know, she did a good job, but she really needed help. And so what I did when I was 17 years old, I dropped out of high school. Uh, the purpose was to go and get myself a job, and I got a bunch of them, a whole bunch of dead-end jobs. I worked as a service station attendant. I worked as a welder, a machinist, a mechanic. And, you know, I really didn't care how hard that work was as long as I could make a good, honest paycheck at the end of that pay period. That's all I cared about. And then I got a lucky break. I got a job at the local phone company. And I say lucky because, see, they didn't know that I hadn't graduated. I kind of got in under the radar. They didn't know I hadn't graduated, and I wasn't talking. <laughs> they were not going to hear that from me. So I stayed on that job for 18 years, worked myself up to making $3,000 a month. just wasn't enough just was not enough. I needed more money, and I needed it desperately. Came home one evening, turned on the TV, and this infomercial comes on. I know most of you have seen those. I certainly did, but this one infomercial changed my life. I think I was ready to hear what the man said. When the man said, hey, come on down to my real estate uh, class that I'm having here. He's having a real estate seminar in my city. Come on down, and I'm going to teach you how to make more money in your spare time than you'd make on a full-time job. He's from the South. Um, that's my horrible rendition of a Southern guy. But, you know, I was so excited to, to see that a seminar was coming to my area that was going to teach me how to be a real estate investor. That's what I wanted to do because I knew that everybody that, that had money in their lives somehow was tied to real estate. And so I wanted to, that day of the seminar to come along so badly, and it finally came along and I got sick. <laughs> and I couldn't go to the seminar, so... I mean, I couldn't go to work, so of course, you know where I went. <laughs> I went to the seminar instead. And I went and I learned about real estate, and uh, I sat there for three days, and I learned some techniques and principles that, had, uh, that allowed me to go from where I was, making $36,000 a year and paying heavy taxes, not having any money left over at the end of the month, actually having money left at the end of the money, into being a multimillionaire through real estate. My specialty is abandoned and distressed properties. That's what I specialize in. I chose to specialize in that because there was no competition whatsoever and also because of government programs. Because I learned that with an abandoned or with a distressed property, many of these properties are in these targeted areas, these empowerment zones, these enterprise areas. And so those are the areas that our government has earmarked to put money into those areas. And so that's why I got involved in abandoned properties. And when I did, my income just skyrocketed. But it could not have skyrocketed had I not incorporated government programs um, with my government, with my uh, abandoned property system. And so that's the reason why we were able to make multiple millions of dollars. That's one of the reasons why. And so that's what I'm going to share with you this afternoon or in this session about uh, the government programs. Some of you may have an idea for business, and that's great. You know, you take that idea for business, and maybe you want to start a new business or maybe expand an existing business. Well, government will help you to do that. And there's a real reason why government will give you money. 
free money to help you to either expand an existing business or start a new business. The reason is because when you start that business or expand that business, you're going to employ more people. And as you employ more people, our unemployment rate goes down. It's badly needed today. And not only that, you're going to produce a product. You will add to the gross national product of America, thus helping to keep America strong. And so that's the reason why they will give you money if you want to expand or start a new business. How about this? If you want to continue your education, maybe go for a higher education, you get help, don't you? Many of you have gone on to college and universities and you've gotten help through grants. Well, there's a very good reason why you get free money to go to school. Because you see, it's been proven that usually people who are educated, people who go for higher education will usually start a business. They don't usually become employees, they become employers. And so when they start a business, you see the cycle happening all over again. They're going to employ more people. The unemployment rate goes down. The gross national product goes up. America gets even stronger still. You see, that's why it's so important to go to government and get your funding first. Um, you know, here's the last thing I'm going to tell you about this. How about this? Um, if you have a hobby that you just love to do, you love to do a certain thing, but you're not making money at it, you're spending money. Well, why not go to government and get yourself a low interest rate loan, a subsidy, or a grant that will enable you to turn that hobby into a business? And now, you see, once again, the cycle starts all over because when you start a business, what are you doing? Hiring more people, contributing to the gross national product, contributing to the wealth and well-being of America, and also you're making money at the same time. And so that's the reason why these government programs are so very, very important. And so you might ask, well, uh, well, how can they continue to give away this money? Well, it, the, the, obvious, the simple uh, answer is very obvious, that when they invest in a certain um, um, area, in, in, the, in the low to moderate income areas, or the low, um, how can I say, the, uh, the weaker link areas, they keep America strong. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The United States of America is still the number one country in the world. There's a reason for it. The reason is because we scan, our government will scan the horizon of America and identify the areas that are considered the weak link areas in America. And so now we understand that we're only as strong as our weakest link. And if we're only as strong as our weakest link, we better look out for the weak link areas. And so when they identify those areas, they label those areas and they call them power, empowerment zones or enterprise areas or targeted areas. And I'm sure you've all heard of those. And so now that they are labeled, these areas are labeled, now our government can get money into those areas to keep those areas strong in the form of programs. Now, here's something that you need to know. Uh, by act of Congress, the United States government cannot be in direct competition with the private sector. All they can do is to fund the government programs, direct those programs toward the weak link areas in America, and encourage us, the entrepreneur, to work the program for the purpose intended. And when we work the, per the program for the purpose intended, our government will pretty much guarantee that we will make a higher than substantial profit than we would make if we did this on a conventional basis. You see, they know this, that we're entrepreneurs and we're money motivated. And in order to work these programs, they've got to make sure that we're going to make more money working the programs than we would make if we didn't work the programs but did whatever that job was on a conventional level. We wouldn't make as much money. And so that's why the government assures us that we will make higher than substantial, well, higher than conventional profits if we will accomplish the same goals by using the government programs. And so, you know, what if we can't make money with these programs? Well, that's real simple. We're money motivated. If we can't make money, we're not going to work the programs. And if we don't work the programs, the people in the weak link areas will not get the help that they need, and America begins to get weak. Can you imagine waking up one morning, turning on CNN, and CNN says, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, overnight, I, uh, I'm so uh, uh, unhappy to say that America has slipped into the status of a third world country. Well, you see, as long as we look out for the uh, for the weakest links in America, and we keep money in those areas, America will never slip into the status of a third world country. But it's very important to work those programs. So now you may consider it your patriotic duty 
to work these programs and make the money and help the people that need your help. You can get rich while you help other people that need your help. One other thing you need to know before we move on. There are two different uh, categories of money that we're going to uh, that, that are available to you. We're going to talk about one of those categories, though. There are two categories. One is project-specific government money, and the other is individual-specific government money. I will explain. The individual-specific money means that if you're going to go after government money, you're going to have to qualify as an individual. You're going to have to have good credit. You've got have to have to have a job. You've got to have some means of paying this money back. You qualify as the individual. They make you jump through hoops, and many times they light those hoops on fire. You qualify as an individual. Project-specific is totally different. This is what I want you to focus on. With project-specific money, either the project will qualify, or the uh, area that the project is in will qualify, or the tenant that's going to reside in that property will qualify. That's project-specific money. You, the individual, do not have to qualify. So if that's the case, don't you understand that you can be homeless on Skid Row and still own real estate and get a check from the government from Section 8? I'm going to give you an example of a tenant, uh, a project-specific money that's uh, quali that where the tenant qualifies. Many of you have rental property right now, and some of you have some of that property rented under the Section 8 subsidy program. And very quickly, the Section 8 subsidy program is a government program that gives subsidies to low to moderate income families to help them to afford safe and sanitary housing for themselves and their families. Other than that, they would be homeless on the street and would not be able to afford, you know, uh, uh, be able to afford to pay the rent. And so what Section 8 does now, they will subsidize that rent. And many, many times, the, the amount of the check that I get from Section 8 is so much, uh, well, here's the example I'm going to give you. I've had tenants that would pay me, let's say the rent is uh, $750 a month. The tenant pays $25 a month, and the government pays $725. Sometimes a tenant pays zero, and the government paid 100%. Sometimes it's on the other end of the scale. Every month, on the first of the month, you will get your check, your Section 8 check from the government. If the first of the month happens to fall on a holiday or a Sunday, you get your check the day before. You see, and that is the great, great thing about working with the Section 8 program and working with these government programs. They're very efficient. And so now that Section 8 tenant, when we get that check from the, uh, from the government for the uh, rent for that Section 8 tenant, did we qualify for that check? That's my question. The answer is no. We, the individual, did not qualify for that check. The tenant qualified for that check. The tenant has to be low income, has to have a certain family makeup, has to jump through certain hoops, but it's the tenant that qualifies, not the owner. And so just like that, you also have projects where, uh, or property where the, the actual project will qualify, or just the fact that the project is sitting in a certain area, a targeted area or an empowerment zone. That's enough to qualify it. And so I want you to get out of your mind that you have to jump through hoops. You have to qualify for these government programs. You have to write out government, um, you have to write out grant proposals, and you have to, you know, sweat bullets trying to uh, get a government grant. No. What we, want to, what we want you to do is to go after project-specific money, not individual-specific money, and it makes all the difference in the world. Okay, I'm going to have to do a little something here on your screen. You're going to watch me do a little housekeeping because I completely forgot to set myself up for the, uh, for the ink. Um, I have an ink pen that I'm going to use, and there it is. Okay, so now we're set up. All right, let's move on. So now it's going to be interesting to understand, and I think important, to understand where these government programs come from and how they actually came about. And I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on that. And then we're going to get into the meat of the program, which are the government programs themselves. Now, we can trace through the times, through the ages, that we've gone through various stages of global development, from the Stone Age, Ice Age, all the way down to the Information Age, which is the age that we're in right now. But look at age number three, the Agricultural Age. You see, that started back in about 10,000 BC. But you see, what's interesting about that, the Agricultural Age, is that we were in the agricultural age up until the early 1900s. Around uh, the early 1900s is when we started to come out. But it's important to understand why we're in that age. You see, 
at that time, the most important thing that we could focus on was land, right? Because we're in agriculture, we want land so we can plant our crops. Also, we want to have livestock. We want to have chickens. We want to have cattle and all that. And we want to have a whole mess of kids and have them grow up real fast so they can handle it all. They can take care of all that stuff. Well, that was then. But you see, the purpose of government is to, first of all, protect us as citizens and also to promote the general welfare, to promote the health of our nation, and also to promote progress. And so the, um, the powers that be back in the early 1900s understood that there's no way that we can grow as a great, great, great nation and keep up with everyone else if we stay stuck in the agricultural age. We've got to get out of it. And so that's when we started to expand our thinking and start looking at promoting programs that would encourage people to come out of the farms and start looking at business and start looking at education and start looking at home ownership. Because when you look at those things, you start to create jobs. And that's what the, the, the uh, foundation of it all was, create more jobs. So around 1910, Congress created the first federally funded enterprises uh, that were created with the constituents in mind to seek higher education, to start a business, or to own a home. Now, let me make sure you understand. The first federally funded enterprises were created with constituents in mind. Let me explain that. You see, when we send our representatives off to uh, Washington, D.C., we want to know that they're working for us. You know, their good old state right back here. My state is California. Your state could be anywhere. But we want to know that they're working for us. And so we want to see what kind of pro programs are you bringing back to your state? What kinds of grants, what kinds of funding are you getting for our state so that we can keep our infrastructure strong and build new bridges and, and build new hospitals and, and do whatever it is that we do with the funds? And so if they weren't able to produce for us as a state, we would vote them out in the next election period and vote someone in who has grander promises and promises to give us all kinds of stuff that we usually never get. But that's what's meant by uh, constituents in mind. And so that's what happened around 1910. We saw the birth of the entitlement system. And this is one of the most important things that you will ever learn. Because as a citizen of America, a citizen of the United States of America, we are entitled to certain things. Under the entitlement system, you get benefits. Uh, if you're an individual, and you get benefits if you're an entity. Entities get benefits as well. Uh, LLCs get benefits. Corporations get these benefits. Um, um, Nonprofit organizations, foundations, all of these are entities and treated just like individuals. So they also are in part of the entitlement system. They have to qualify under re requirements that are set by law whether you're an individual, a Reggie Brooks or John Doe, or whether you're a corporation, you still have to qualify. qualify. You're going to recognize some of these programs. Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, Social Security, unemployment, VA programs, and federal employment retirement programs, also military retirement programs. All of these and so many more are part of the entitlement system that you're entitled to as an American citizen. You're entitled to that. So don't ever forget that. It's not like, oh, I hope, I hope. You are entitled. Now, OK, so we wanted all of that, but we have to pay for it. Just like these days, we have all these wonderful programs that we want to uh, initiate, but we have to pay for them. We have to figure out a way to pay for them. Well, way back then, couldn't figure out a way to pay for it, huh? Well, they were worried about how to pay for all those programs. But you see, they found a way, didn't they? And these programs are very strong now. They found a way. And we will always find a way. We are a great, great nation. And just like a blade of grass that busts its way through a, a, a concrete slab, it finds a way. Here's how they funded it. Around 1915, Congress enacted a law that stated that 1% of business and personal income tax over $2,000 would be taxed. 1%. All business and personal income over $20,000 would be taxed at 1%. That's what that actually means. Now, understand this. Back then, in 1915, that was the only government income that there was. 1% of income from businesses and individuals that was over $20,000. Now, we know that back in 1915, there were not a lot of people that were making over $20,000 back then. We know that. And so if you
you look at this, 1% of $20,000 is only $200. But that was the only income that was coming into our federal government. And then around 1925, short time later, Congress expanded the interest uh, in promoting education, businesses, and home ownership. This is when they really got geared up and started looking at ways to expand our country. And this is the way that they did it, through expanding interest in education, business, and home ownership. And then around 1934, Congress enacted the National Housing Act, and also that was the birth of the Housing Authority. So that's kind of a chronological background of where we were. Now, we're still talking about how we're trying to pay for this. After World War II, well, when World War II erupted, uh, the income tax went up for personal and businesses that were over $20,000. It increased from 1% to 5%. Well, everybody kind of understood that because, well, no big thing. We're in a war now. And so well, I don't mind paying my fair share, so we'll let you raise that from 1% to 5%, but it was supposed to be for a temporary or tax raise. It was supposed to be for a short period of time. And then here's what happened. When the war was over, over 2, two million veterans returned home from the war. Oh, my goodness. Now we've got to figure out how to house these folks, what to do with all these folks. And so after World War II, Congress decided to keep that 5% tax to provide the housing and educational benefits uh, for the vets. And so we thought that that was a good thing. Even then, that was definitely a good thing to do. And so since then, taxes have increased and the number of programs are, are now in the hundreds. I would say that the number of programs are in the thousands. And especially when we consider that there are so many programs that are that are born uh, from agencies and from corporations and from n uh, nonprofit organizations and from public as well as private foundations. There's so many programs that we can't keep up with them all. There's no possible way that we can keep up with them all. If you take a look at your screen, you're looking at three very familiar faces, Lee Iacocca, Ross Perot, and Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, we had the uh, pleasure of sharing the program with Donald Trump uh, oh, many different, uh, many different times. And I have to say that I, I am just, um, I'm floored at this man, the way that he goes about making money. And you see, we can all take a lesson from these three, because these are three of the biggest users of these government programs in America. They use these programs extensively. And so it's not just for rich people, and it's not just for poor people, it's for all Americans. If you're rich, you use the program to help to, uh, to, help to uh, um, create funding or create projects for the poor people. And you are rewarded handsomely. You will use these programs to create projects for, other, for less fortunate people. And you are rewarded as well as the less fortunate people. They're rewarded as well. So very, very important background in uh, these government programs, how they came about, what sustains them, and the reason why we have them. Because without these government programs, America would certainly not be the strongest country in the world. So let's talk about getting cash from the government. Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that this cash is going to be distributed on four, from four different levels. It's going to be distributed from the federal level, from the state level, from the county level, and also from the local or the municipal level. These are the various levels that, that the cash is distributed from. And these are levels that you can go to under certain circumstances. You can go as high as federal government to get a direct loan from the feds. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Another way of getting uh, cash distributed is through insured loans. And with an insured loan, what's going to happen, you're not going to get the money directly from the government. This is not a direct loan. You will apply through a conventional lender. That conventional lender goes through his underwriting processes to qualify you, and then they will uh, make the loan. The government is going to insure that loan. So they'll issue an insurance policy that says that if that lender make, uh, suffers any losses, and the losses can be extensive. They can be beyond just the loan amount. They can be all kinds of fees, and, and uh, uh, you know, they can be uh, penalties, and there can be re rehabilitation uh, fees there, all kinds of stuff. So that's an insured loan. Also, with an insured loan, the lender is going to be 100% insured against things like defaults and costs, foreclosure costs. Uh, well, that's default costs, foreclosure costs, eviction process costs a back interest that was not paid by that, uh, by that trust store that went under, and also legal fees. So they're going, to be rep uh, they're going to be reimbursed for all of those. I'll tell you a quick story. 
I was on the phone with a lender, and I wanted to buy this particular property. It was a distressed, abandoned property, and I tracked it down. It had become an REO uh, some time before. And so I called the lender because the lender took the property back. And I said, I want to make a loan. Where should I send the offer to? He says, well, you know, that offer is going to have to be pretty high because we're getting reimbursed from the uh, feds on this. So talking to him further, I understood. He had an insured loan. This was an FHA insured loan. And, and he says, all I have to do is wait 14 more days, and I'm going to get more than what the loan is. And so in 14 days, FHA is going to send him a check for not only the principal amount, but all of these other fees that we're looking at on the screen now, whatever fees he decides to plunk down on a piece of paper, he's going to get paid for. And we know what happens a lot of times. Those greed glands kick in, and, and people start writing down all kinds of fees you know, mother-in-law fee, whatever fee they come, come up with, they write it down and they get reimbursed for it. And that's unfortunate. You know, it's very, very unfortunate to misuse a system like that, but it does happen. But this is the process on an insured loan. Now, let's talk about a guaranteed loan, a guaranteed loan from the government. What you're going to do is apply through a conventional lender because, once again, the government is not going to issue that loan. They're going to guarantee the loan. The lender is going to make the loan. The government is going to guarantee less than 100% of that loan amount. And the borrower will pay no premium for that loan, will pay no premium. And so now what happens if, well, if the government is going to guarantee less than 100%, well, what do we do with the rest of that uh, with the deficit? How can I get that uh, funded? Well, we're going to talk a little bit later on about some of the other ways to, uh, to fund that deficit. If the government will guarantee 95% of the loan, you've got to come up with 5%. I'm going to show you in a few minutes one of our students that wanted to buy her first home. And the one thing that I really love about her is that she was so committed and she was so diligent in her efforts that she ended up buying her first home and she only paid $55 out of her pocket, actually $55 and some change. And so as I go through that process, you're going to understand how you can make up the differences in the deficit between uh, this 95% of the guaranteed amount and 5% that you have to come up with. And it gets to be so exciting because, you see, with these, loan, with these government loans and government grants, these government programs, many of them are so liberal that you can get as many grants as you can, uh, that you can uh, qualify for. You're not, just, uh, you're not just confined to one grant or one particular program. And you'll see that as I go on, uh, especially when I tell you about Kim. Uh, Kim did such a great job on that. Okay, and then we finally get to direct loans. Now, this is the one that I like best because this is, is I'm an investor. Come on. My job is to make as much money as I can with the least amount of effort in the shortest period of time. And direct loans helps me to do that. Let me tell you why. Because with a direct loan, these loans are offered by state, uh, federal, state, city, or county agencies. You will get the lowest interest rates of all the programs, of all the programs. You apply directly to the government. That's why it's called a direct loan. And the government will fund the loan proceeds directly to you. So in this case, you go straight to the federal government under certain programs. You go straight to the state. You go straight to the city or the county or the municipality. And the money is funded directly from that government agency. The interest rates are usually between 1% and 9%. Right now, we had very, very low interest rates. I think they're historically low. And so if these direct loans are always lower than conventional rates, then can you imagine what these direct loans are running at right now? How much uh, in interest you'd have to pay right now? Very, very, very little. So direct loans, it, it pays to go after these loans. It makes sense to go after these loans. Now, we all know about grants. Everyone loves grants because everyone is lazy and they want free money. Well, I just, want to, uh, I just want to tell you that, yes, there are lots of grants out there. However, they're not as easy to come by as one might think, especially one might be convinced that they're easy by someone, but they're not necessarily that easy. You do have to work for these. You have to go after them. They're there because people are getting grants every single day, and they're not having to write out great big long grant proposals because they're going after the project-specific money, and they're getting grants. Let me give you an, uh, an example of a grant that we got. I found a, um, an agency 
that was connected to CDBG, which is Community Development Block Grants. This agency was connected. And I called and I talked to the director of this grant program. And the director told me, oh, yes, yes, we have plenty of money. Let me ask you a couple questions. And he started asking me questions. And I answered each question that he asked. And the questions just kept coming and the answers kept coming. And questions kept coming and I'm starting to get frustrated. And then after a long, what seemed like such a long time, says, okay, well, I'd like to go ahead and finalize this. Now, when can you come into the office to finalize? Well, I told him the very next day. I'll come tomorrow. When I got down to the office, I sat across the desk from him. He shoved over an application to me. Most of the, the blanks were already filled in. He was actually asking me the questions from the application and filling in the answers for me. Basically, all I had to do was to sign the application, fill in a couple little holes and sign it. That's all I had to do. I got that grant money in 28 days. Let me explain something to you. Why it's so important to understand that so many people are not aware of these grants, and so therefore, the money doesn't go out where it should. Here's what happens. Federal government, under let's say under a community development block grant, they issue grants down to a state agency, okay? State agency has $10 million. They have to get this money out in one fiscal year, $10 million into the community, because that $10 million is going to build up the community, beef it up, and that's another weak link in America that stays strong. Okay, we understand that. Now, that, that fiscal year is almost coming to a close. It is coming to a close, and this agency is only giving out $5 million. What happens to the other $5 million? Well, they can't put it in their pockets and take it home. They give it back to CDBG, to the source, uh, to the source program that, that uh, provided the money to them. And so they get back $5 million. Now, next fiscal year, when it comes time to get more money for that agency, are they going to get another $10 million? No, they're not. They're not even going to get $5 million because, you see, they're on a downward spiral. They're on a decline. So CDBG will assume that since they're on a decline, they're only going to give away maybe $3 million this time. So they just went from $10 million to $3 million. Now, all of a sudden, this agency has great big problems because they have overhead. They've got secretaries to pay. They've got all this hired help. Even though they're a nonprofit, they still have expenses. And so now that they're only down to $3 million and they're supposed to give that away and pay all the administrative costs at the same time, so you can see the vice is tightening. And when this gentleman helped me to get that loan, um, we were running a, um, uh, in Los Angeles at the time, we were running the Los Angeles chapter of the Real Estate Investment Association. And I invited him to come down and talk to my, uh, to my people in, in the investment club. And he was thrilled to do that because he didn't, you know, people just don't know about these loans. So when he came down to talk, he informed everybody about the loans. And he gave everybody brochures. He gave everybody cards. And he says, please come and get this money. Because if you don't, I'm not going to be able to get the same amount next year and the vice tightens even more. And that's basically the bottom line. But do you know I kept up, uh, I kept up with this gentleman? And do you know very, very few people? actually took advantage of those grants. But grants are great. They're a form of the entitlement program. Less than one percent of, uh, less than one half of one percent of our population ever applies for the grants. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, most people don't believe that there is a such thing as free money. They don't understand how the entitlement system works and how giving our government giving away free money actually makes us stronger. They don't understand that. Okay, and then the other thing is that our government, by act of Congress, cannot be in direct competition with the private sector. So they can't advertise. And so you won't hear about that so much unless uh, usually you'll hear by uh, word of mouth, but you won't see advertising about it. Uh, you've got to apply with the authorizing grant, grant agency, which is the state, county, or on the city level, and you have to follow the program guidelines. You can actually, if you do those things, you can actually receive an unconditional grant where you never, ever have to pay that money back. So exciting. Here's something that I want you to take down. Uh, write this down. You've got to write this website down. www.cfda.gov. That's a catalog of federal domestic assistance. 
Now, when many years ago, you had to go down to the office and pay for the book, and then you would haul the book back home, and you would go through it page after page, after thousands of pages. That's how big it was. And I'm sure it's a little smaller now, but it's still very substantial. And in this work, you're going to find all the grants, all the uh, low interest rate loans, all of the programs that are available in America. It's a catalog of federal domestic assistance, all domestic assistance. That's within our, or, or, uh, within our country, and that's not continental. It also goes uh, outside of our continent. As long as it's part of America, uh, it's uh, these programs you can use there. And what I did, I just showed you the first page of an alphabetical index of programs. This is just the first page of the A section. There are thousands of programs here. And so what I encourage you to do is go to the website. Look for anything having to do with real estate, anything having to do with mortgage. If you're interested in business, anything having to do with business, if you're interested in education, anything having to do with education, okay? And you're going to be astounded at the programs that pop up. Here's another one that's, uh, that's worth writing down. This is HUD.gov. Most people know about HUD.gov. Uh, this is a great program. Uh, this is the backbone of a lot of people's wealth in real estate, HUD.gov. And if you go to this website, you're going to find over in the top left corner, there's a thing that says homes, buying, owning, selling, renting, homeless, home improvement, and HUD homes. Those are the categories that you can select from. Down a little bit lower, you'll see where it says working with HUD, grants, programs, contracts, and work online. This is where you can learn about the HUD grants, about what grants are available. So what you have to do, in the top right corner up there, you select the state. Select the state that you want to find these kinds of programs in. So let's see what I selected. I selected Florida. And in Florida, let's see. In Florida, this is the Florida page that you're looking at now on your screen. And you can see right about in the middle of the page there, on the left side, it says Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Well, that's just one of the programs that's available uh, through HUD in Florida. But I clicked on that, and I want to show you what I found. Here's what I found. This is the Neighborhood uh, Stabilization Program grants. These are grants that you can get. And the purpose is this. HUD's new neighborhood, neighborhood Stabilization Program will provide emergency assistance to state and federal governments to acquire and redevelop foreclosed properties that might otherwise become sources of abandonment and blight within their community. Look at what they're saying. Look at what they're saying here. They're saying that they will give you money to go out and buy these foreclosed properties because they don't want them to become a source of abandonment and blight. They're trying to help you to get involved in real estate. Acquire and redevelop. Now watch this next sentence, or this next paragraph. The Neighborhood Stabilization Program provides grants to every state and certain local communities to purchase, now watch this, purchase, foreclose, or abandon homes and to rehabilitate, resell, or redevelop these homes. That's the most important part right there, and I'm going to read it again. To purchase foreclosed or abandoned homes and to rehabilitate, resell, or redevelop these homes in order to stabilize neighborhoods and stem the decline of housing values in neighboring homes. Isn't this wonderful? And people say, well, you know, the government programs, oh, they just don't work. Well, have you ever tried one? No, but I, I heard that they don't work. Oh, John told me that... Uh, his, his uncle's uh, sister's brother's cousin tried one one time, and it didn't work. So I know they don't work. Okay, it don't work for you. Get out of my way while I go make it work for me. Here's another HUD uh, page that I want you to see. This is HUD Homes. You see, one of those criteria that you can click on or that you can search for is homes that are owned by HUD. And so in the middle of the page, you can see that there's a list of uh, states right there. And if you click on the state that you're interested in, it'll take you to a page that lists the homes that are there in your area for purchase. Um, here I clicked on, what did I click on here? I clicked on Florida. And you can see here in Florida, you have the address of the property there. You have the price of the property there. You have the number of beds and number of baths there. The list date is there. The bid deadline is there. And the priority is there. Now, some of these have a certain priority that will inhibit an investor to bid on them right away, like that first one. You have to be an owner-occupant, and investors can bid on this property 
on 3-30-2009. Okay, this is a little older one. But just to give you an idea of how this all works, you have pictures on the left-hand side, and I'm sure when you click on the pictures, it'll blow them up so that you can see what's here, you know, see what you're getting. And then you have all the other information that you need in order to make a decision. But these are the things that you can do with some of these programs, some of these government programs, and especially in going to the HUD website. You'll see an awful lot of good stuff. Like this one, the Neighbor Next Door, Good Neighbor Next Door program. This is a wonderful, wonderful program. This is HUD. And HUD says this, the law enforcement officers, pre-kindergarten through 12th grade teachers and firefighters and emergency medical ticket technicians can contribute to community revitalization while becoming homeowners through HUD's Good Neighbor Next Door sales program. Let's look at another paragraph here. HUD offers a substantial incentive in the form of a discount of, you ready for this, 50% from the list price of the home. You will get a discount of 50% from the list price of the home. If you're a law enforcement off, uh, officer or a teacher, K through 12, or firefighter, or an emergency medical technician or one of those, and in return, what has to happen is that you're going to commit to living in the property for 36 months as your sole resident. And some, uh, sometimes uh, you may not want to live in a property that long. But to get a 50% reduction in the list price, Man, that's quite a gimme, and that, uh, that's quite an incentive, and the program works extremely well because what it's doing is putting people in homes, giving them a tremendous discount. Uh, they are hiring people to do work on their houses. Thus, we have jobs going. Those people that are doing work, they've got to go to Home Depot and Lowe's and all the hardware stores to buy stuff. And so what it does, it feeds our economy, our economic machine. It feeds it, and it feeds it very well. And so sometimes people come up to me and say, well, Reg, my credit is bad. Is there anything for me? Well, <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact. You see, you should know about the 203B Mortgage Insurance Program. The, mortgage, the FHA Mortgage Insurance Program, it will, it will allow you to borrow money to buy a property if your credit, your credit standards are lower with this program. So if you've got bad credit, many times you can still qualify. You know, your down payment requirements are lower. So if you're having trouble with your down payment, many times you can still qualify. The FHA limits have been raised to almost three quarters of a million dollars. So what's your excuse? If you got bad credit, you got no down payment yet, you can still uh, approach the FHA limit of almost three quarters of a million dollars. So some of these programs are designed for people with credit flaws. I want to tell you about Kim. I mentioned her earlier. And I want to tell you about her first house. Kim wanted this house so badly, and Kim was going to get what she wanted because she was committed. If you will only commit to what you want in life and then take action behind that commitment, you will achieve what you want in life, and that's what Kim did. Kim wanted her first house, and she looked and looked and looked, and she finally found one, and she found one that she really loved, and it was $86,283.46. That's what it worked up to be. So let me tell you how Kim purchased this house. Kim could scratch up a deposit of $1,000, and she did that. So $1,000 went down as a deposit. Chase Manhattan was giving grants at that time, and Kim approached Chase Manhattan, found out what their grant criteria was, met the grant criteria, and she got herself a, a grant of $41,269. She also went to her city, and her city had a grant program there for first-time home buyers. First-time home buyers, she got a grant of $4,184. Then the Farmers Home Loan and Mortgage Corporation, they helped her out quite a bit because they gave her a two-for-one credit. So she put $1,000 down, they gave her another $1,000 on top of that, and then they gave her a credit of $2,000. And so that helped. She had an application fee credit of $275. The gas and electric company right there in her town gave her a first-time home buyer grant of $2,500. CDBG came in real big. The Community Development Block Grant, she went straight to them, and she found that they had a grant that she qualified for, and she got another $35,000 to put toward her home. Let's total it up. She now has a total of $86,228. What does she need? She was short a little bit. She needed $55.46 to complete this transaction. Do you think she completed this transaction? <laughs> she certainly did. 
and now she owns this home, and she is in, uh, she's in hog heaven. Because this was her first home. Since then, she's gone on, and she's become a multimillionaire, um, you know, doing real estate. But you see, this is what she did getting into her first home as a first-time home buyer. And this is so exciting because it shows you what you can do if you just get excited and you just get focused. And you put one foot in front of the other, and you go ahead and you make it work for you. Kim certainly did make it work for her, and we're all so very proud of her. Kim was a first-time home buyer, and there are a lot of programs out there for first-time home buyers. Let's talk about those right now. First-time home buyer programs, here's one, and this is a very recent program, very recent. This is a Fannie Mae First Look program, the First Look program. And you see back in August 2009, uh, Fannie Mae introduced an initiative, and this is an initiative, and it's designed to help individual home buyers help public entities and also nonprofits and also certain for-profit entities as well that use public funds. They have the option, the first option, to look at and to purchase Fannie Mae properties during a certain defined period of time. And that's the, the certain defined period of time during the Fannie Mae listing. Okay, it's usually 15 days. So under the First Look initiative, during the first 15 days, a Fannie Mae property is listed for sale. Only, uh, only offers from owner occupants, from the public entities, and, or their partners are going to be considered by Fannie Mae. Now, if you're an investor like me, you can submit the offer, but it's not going to be looked at until the first 15 days expire. And so that's what happens with the First Look program. So in summary, individual buyers have to be owner occupant. They have to occupy the property. Uh, they, you have an exclusive period of 15 days in which to take advantage of this special buying opportunity. But as a first-time home buyer, you got that special buying opportunity. And of course, we know the purpose is to increase home ownership, and it's increasing home ownership all over the country. Here's something big. This can actually be used with the American Dream Program. The American Dream Program is a great, great program. As a matter of fact, let's talk about that, the American Dream Program. The American Dream uh, Down Payment Initiative Program, is, is, uh, it was actually signed into law back in December 2003. And what it does, it increases the home ownership rate, especially among lower income and minority households. And it also revitalizes and also stabilizes communities. And what it's going to do, it's going uh, to help first-time home buyers with the biggest hurdle of home ownership that there is. What's the biggest hurdle for a first-time home buyer? We know what it is. It's down payment and closing costs. Usually that's exactly what it is. Well, this program was created to assist low-income, first-time home buyers in purchasing the uh, single-family home up to four units. And what this home buyer, uh, American Dream uh, Down Payment Initiative is going to do, it will provide down payment, also provide closing costs, and will also provide rehabilitation assistance to eligible individuals. We'll provide all of that. Um, to be eligible, you've got to be a first-time home buyer. Now, if you don't know if you're a first-time home buyer, here's the criteria. Have you or your spouse owned a home uh, within the last three years? If you have not, you're a first-time home buyer. You have to have had a house within the, first, the last three years to, be, uh, to not qualify for first-time home buyer status. So if I've confused you, uh, you've not owned a home in the, in the last three years, you are a first-time home buyer. So the American Dream Program, it's a down payment initiative program. It's also going to fund your closing costs and do light rehab for you. You're going to have to complete the rehab within the first year after you close on this property. And this program can be used to purchase a single family residence up to four units, up to four units. Very, very great program. Love this program. We're still talking about first time home buyer programs. You know what I did? I did a simple Google search uh, just a little while ago, and I came up with uh, a certain uh, series of keywords that I put into Google, and it gave me an awful lot of hits. Here's the keywords that I used. Government was one keyword, and then first-time homebuyer programs. Government and first-time homebuyer programs. I hit go, and I got an awful lot of government first-time homebuyer programs. Now, Here's the thing. I looked at a bunch of them, but I came up with this one that I want you to write down. Now, this is the link on your screen right now, www.topgovernmentgrants.com 
forward slash home underscore buyer dot php. Now when you go to that web page, you're going to go to a page that's going to give you a whole lot of information on first time home buyers. And then also toward the top, it will give you an option to click on um, a, a link that will take you to first time home buyer programs. Now that next link is going to take you to a page with all of the states in the country. So you click on the state that you're interested in, whether it's your state or a state that you want to invest in. I happen to click on Illinois. Now I can't show you this on your screen, but I'm going to read it to you. When I clicked on Illinois, it gave me a couple of programs that are very interesting as a first time home buyer. Now before I go into this, let me explain to you seasoned investors. If you're wondering, well, why am I spending so much time on first time home buyer programs? Well, it's because of this. These days, it's kind of tough getting houses sold. It's kind of tough doing that. And so if you have property as a seasoned investor that's ready to sell, but you're having trouble finding buyers, when you come across a first-time home buyer, do you think it might help you if you have certain programs, knowledge of certain programs in your hip pocket, in your toolbox? You whip out the knowledge of these programs, and then you can... You can guide your buyer into these programs and then get your property sold. If other people are not doing this, do you think that it will benefit you as a seasoned investor? Of course it will. That's why I want you to pay attention to these first-time home buyer programs because they're not for you. They're for your buyers. Very, very important. They're for your buyers. So when I clicked on Illinois, come across two interesting programs. One of them is called the Home Start 30-Year Fixed Rate Loan. Home Start 30-Year Fixed Rate Loan. And the Illinois Home Start Loan Program, I'm going to read this to you, is designed to help first-time home buyers achieve the dream of home ownership affordably. The first loan under the Home Start Program is a 30-year fixed loan, amortize, a fixed amortizing loan insured by FHA. As of February 8, 2010, the interest rate was 5%. Do you think that our interest rates have gone down since then? They have, haven't they? So this loan is also going down as well. Now that's for the purchase and a 30-year fixed rate loan. But if you're wondering, well, where will I come up with the down payment? Well, if you just read a little bit further, you'll see it. And there it is right there. Home Start Down Payment Assistance Loan is right under the Home Start 30-year fixed rate loan. It's right under that. And it says here that the down payment is a 10-year, 0% non-amortizing, forgivable loan in the amount of 3% of the purchase price up to $6,000. Well, some of you living like, if you're living in California, that might not be enough to afford a phone booth. But so many other parts of the country, $6,000 is, is a down payment on a nice little house, either to live in or to use as an investment. You know, $6,000 can work. But you see, this is money that you didn't know about before. And so when you just click on your state and you find out what programs are available for your first-time home buyers, and you season investors, you do it too. And you write these programs down so that when that home buyer comes to you and wants to buy your house, you're able to get him into that house, get him help, get him down payment assistance, get him acquisition assistance, get him rehab assistance. Now you're going to look like the house doctor, the house expert. Now when he's done with you, do you think he'll come back to you maybe later on to buy a second house? Do you think he's going to tell his friends about how great a service you, you gave, you provided, and how you actually got him into that house? And so you're doing a good thing. And so, you know, don't, don't uh, kick a gift horse in the mouth. Look a good gift horse in the mouth. I think that's what they used to say. All right. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about home improvement loans. And one of the easiest loans to get is your Title I home improvement loan. Let me show you a little bit about this Title I loan. You will usually get this loan at a lower interest rate and fees because their underwriting standards are lower as well. You're going to get a great, great loan with low interest rates and also with lowered underwriting standards. The lowered underwriting standards, what that actually means is that uh, you will be more apt to qualify with this loan than with other loans that have normal underwriting standards. In other words, they don't care so much that your credit is so bad and you've got no money. Uh, there are no income limits on eligibility, so you can make a million dollars an hour, and you can still be eligible for this Title I home improvement loan. You can also receive uh, up to $25,000 for a single-family home. So if you've acquired an abandoned property, and maybe you got it with owner financing because we know that they lend themselves extremely well to 
um, owner financing and no money down. And so now you're trying to figure out how am I going to do the rehab. Go to Title I. Get yourself a $25,000 uh, Title I loan for that single family home. Do your fix-up work. When you sell that property, you pay that loan off. You can also get up to $60,000, up to $60,000 for a multifamily home, for a, an apartment building. Twenty-five for a single, sixty thousand for an apartment. Title one loan, very, very exciting. Okay, so there's another program for you: purchase or refinance multifamily uh, rental housing. We're going to kick it up a little bit because I want to get through these programs. This is a program of HUD that I want you to know about. Uh, with this program, the property cannot require substantial rehab. It's got to be pretty light rehab. HUD will allow non-critical repairs after the critical repairs are done. And the mortgage term can be up to 35 years. It may be a housing product. Uh, it may be housing projects of five units or more. You see, so this is multifamily rental housing program. You want to get some purchase money or refinance money? You can do it through HUD Section 207/223F, and that's this program. Also, the cost cannot exceed uh, $6,500 per unit. Well, that's still substantial. That's very substantial. Do you know there's a program for renters? You know, we're always talking about homeowners or investors, but there's programs for renters as well. Uh, with your renters, there's a home program, and what this does is provide rental assistance and uh, security deposits to help you to get into your rental property if you're having trouble uh, with uh, security deposits and rental assistance, and, and you can get the rental assistance. Uh, your Section 8 subsidy program. This is a rental uh, program, a renter's program. You heard me talk a little bit about Section 8 just a little while ago. The Section 8 subsidy is for very low-income families. And the family is given a housing choice voucher. And in this voucher, they can take it anywhere within the city. And um, they, it can be accepted anywhere in the city. The owner agrees to participate in the program. He doesn't have to, but he agrees to. And the housing subsidy is paid directly to the landlord. And as I said earlier, it's paid on the first of every month. If the first falls on a holiday or a Sunday, it comes the day before that. Okay, a very very nice program. Business loans and grants. Let's talk about that. Small business is now. I don't know if you know this, but small business is really the backbone of our country because it employs over 50 percent of the national workforce. You know, it used to be that the large mega corporations were what ran everything, but now you know, small business is responsible for so much in our country, and so that's one of the reasons why so much money is placed into small business loans and grants. Uh, two of three new jobs in America are created by small business. Now that's astounding, and that's why in this housing recovery, or in this economic recovery, that money has to be put into small businesses. Tax breaks have to be given to small businesses because they're the backbone. Also, 40% of our gross national product is produced by small businesses. Now, this is important. All the ideas, most of the ideas and innovations, they come from small businesses. Because here's the way it works. With a small business, you're growing. And as you're growing, you're going you're gonna to experience growing pains. Now, if you're going to be a surviving business, you're going to figure out ways to, uh, to offset those growing pains, but to solve those growing pains. And as you solve them, you're coming up with innovative and creative methods. You're coming up with, uh, with, uh, with ideas that other businesses can use. And then you can see growth on an exponential basis. And so that's small business loans and grants. The SBA, Small Business Administration, administers a lot of loans, a lot of loans. And the purpose is this. Once again, we talked about business earlier that if they can get money out into people's hands that are going to create a new business or expand an existing business, what that does is give a shot in the arm to the American economy. And it, and it also spurts growth in the American economy. And so through the SBA, you can get small business loans. There's a small business loan program that's a really good program. You can get seasonal lines of credit. Um, you can get contract loans. Uh, there's a handicap assistance program. Vietnam and Disabled Veterans Loans, Small Business Innovation Research. Now, these are some of, the, uh, some of the activity that you can participate in with the SBA. Now, we talked a little bit about Community Development Block Grants, a CDBG. Usually, you'll, heard, you'll hear it referred to as CDBG. 
Now, CDBG is very important because this is where you're going to find uh, a lot of the oh, the parks are going to be uh, you know renewed or parks are being built. Or uh, here's something that you you would never guess, but I remember at one point Beverly Hills, California, was an enterprise area. It was a targeted zone. Now we all think of targeted zones being the poor areas. But Beverly Hills, California for, was for a short time a targeted zone. The reason was this. They somehow, the powers that be somehow figured out a way to make it a targeted zone because the infrastructure, the sewage infrastructure needed to be repaired. And so since that was the case, they extended it to Beverly Hills. That allowed them to bring in CDBG money. And so with CDBG money, they dug up all the streets and replaced all of the uh, so therefore, they were able to do it with government funding. And so it's kind of an interesting play on CDBG. Um, you must benefit from families or aid in the prevention or the elimination of uh, slums and blight. The entitlement CDBG is designed for populations of 50,000 or more, whereas the non-entitlement CDBG is designed for populations of 49999 and less. Okay, that's a... Uh, a little bit about CDBG. Now, here's CDBG for businesses. In CDBG for business, you can get $27,500 to improve the physical appearance of a non-residential commercial building. Why would they give you over $27,000 to make the outside look good? Well, they, because they know that if you have a business and the outside looks poor, you're not going to get very much in the way of uh, traffic into your business. So they want to encourage you to bring traffic in, get business coming into your front door, and if you have to, spruce up the outside. And so that's what this money is earmarked for. Real estate acquisition to construct a commercial building which houses a business, working capital to expand an existing business which will employ low to moderate income people. Uh, this will help you to qualify to get CDBG money. Now, there's a thing called housing loans and grants. I want to spend a little bit of time on that. And with housing loans and grants, you can get low interest rate loans, you can get subsidies, and you can get grants from three major departments of government. What are those departments? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here they are. HUD, Housing and Urban Development is one. The Department of Agriculture is another. And the third is the Farmers Home Administration. These are the three major departments of government where all this money comes from, major departments, and then there are departments under that. Under the urban homesteading program, you can buy a single family residence from one dollar from one dollar to twenty five hundred dollars. Under the urban homesteading program, this is a great program. It's, it's earmarked for moderate uh, income families. You have to be moderate income. You have to buy a moderately priced home, and the owners must agree to repair the home, but watch this last one. And you must occupy the home for three years. Not the one year, but for three years. And so this becomes a very interesting program because you can buy a single family residence for one dollar, up to twenty-five hundred dollars, and you're going to stay in it for three years. I think that's very well worth it. You probably think so too. And so these are programs that are available for you. But most of these programs, uh, these grant programs, well, a lot of them don't care about you know, whether your credit is good or whatever because you're not going to pay it back. But some of these are loan programs. And people come up to me and say, well, I'm kind of credit impaired. Uh, is there any, um, any help for me? And I'll say, well, yes, there are programs there for credit impaired people. And to qualify, you have to apply at least two different banks and you have to be turned down by at least two different banks. Then you go and you can apply with the government and possibly qualify for money from the government. Apply and be turned down by two different banks. And I know that's not a problem for most people in America. So if you're credit impaired, you have no excuses. You got no excuse. There's a special credit risk home program. This is the one that I'm talking about right now. Low to moderate income families is what it's for. Marginal credit risk families is what it's for. HUD will provide debt management for you. They want to make sure that if your credit is bad right now, it may be because you're just not aware of how to make your credit good. So they're going to sit down, and they're going to give you debt management classes. And you sit down there, and you listen, and you learn, and you make a change in the way that you handle your financial affairs, and your credit never goes bad again. You apply through FHA, and you can get anywhere from $18,000 to $110,000.
but no, my credit is bad. I can't get a government program. I don't have good credit. Well, yes, you can. What you do have is a good excuse, and that excuse keeps you poor. Drop your excuses, pick up action, and go out there and get these programs for yourself. There's a residential community development block grant program. And what this is used for is to improve single family and apartment buildings. Cities uh, grant, uh, grant the funds to the citizens. You see, this comes from federal down in through the state, and then it's just uh, distributed to the cities. And so the cities will grant funds to the citizens of those cities. 60% or more of the funds have to be used by individuals, by families, or by the property owner. And persons making 80% of the median income for that area are going to have to benefit from the CDBG money. And there's no maximum loan amount. You can borrow as much money as you need. No maximum loan amount. I like that. And the interest rate can be as little as 3%. Well, once again, this was when the interest rates were higher. Our interest rates have dropped to historic lows now. This 3% may be even lower now. Maybe. It's up to you to check it out. It's up to you to form a commitment for your future and move forward and check these things out. There's an apartment development grant. You want to develop an apartment, here's a program that you can use. In rural areas with populations greater than 50,001 people, you can use it. You can use it to build or rehab apartment buildings. You can, uh, investors can get up to 50% of the cost to build or rehab their apartment building from the government, up to 50% of the cost. The bank will lend the other 50%. Watch this. No payments are due for the first 30 years on the government program. That's like free money, isn't it? 30 years you go without making a payment. That's pretty doggone good. And that's to encourage you to build or develop apartment buildings. Here's Nonprofit Senior Citizen Apartment Loan Program. And this program is designed to build, to buy, and to construct senior citizen apartment complexes. The maximum loan amount is $12.5 million. The investment, the interest rate is going to be approximately 3%. And so this money is there for over $12 million to help our senior citizens. I want to tell you about my mom's silent second. We're talking about helping seniors. And this is something that is really, really dear to my heart. My mom was really ill, but, and she knew that she had not that much longer to go. But she wanted to live out her final days, and hopefully it would be a year, and it turned out to be a couple of years. She wanted to live those in her home, but she wanted to remodel her home. She wanted to fix up her kitchen. She wanted to fix up her bath and kind of spruce up the rest of the house. So I went looking for a government program, and I found something in her community. Remember that the money flows from federal to state to the uh, count, uh, cities and then to the counties. Uh, I'm sorry, to the counties and then into the cities. And so in her city, she lives in Inglewood, California. In her city, we found a program or a an agency called the Neighborhood Housing Services, Inglewood Neighborhood Housing Services. And with Inglewood Neighborhood Housing Services, they were going to give us a silent second of $13,500 to fix up her house. And what this means is this, the silent second will just sit on the property as a second mortgage. No payments are to be made. No payments to be made at all, unless you change title. If you sell the property or you change title in any way, then that $13,500 has to be paid back at that time. And so you never change the title, you never pay the money back. And so what we did is this. After we, uh, we put that silent second on to her house and we did the work and all that, we placed her property into a trust. And I was the trustee. And so now, uh, well, my brother lives in the property now, but it's never changed title. The title is in trust. But what if I wanted to sell that property? How could I possibly sell this property and not activate that silent second and have to pay that silent second? Well, it's really easy. Because what you're going to do is you're going to sell the beneficial interest in the trust. You don't sell the house. You sell the trust. You sell the beneficial interest in the trust. So the title on the house never changes. So now I am trustee of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th Street uh, property, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5th Street Trust. I'm the trustee. I sell the beneficial interest to John Doe over there. Now John Doe is a trustee. John Doe now has the authority to call all the shots on that property. He doesn't own the property. I didn't own the property either. The trust owned the property. 
so therefore we never change title, and so therefore that $13,500 then becomes a grant as far as we're concerned. And so that's another way that we can kind of back in through a silent second, we can back into making it a grant by using some of these other tools, you know, like a, a tool like the trust, for instance. There are grants for personal needs. Let me show you what I found. In New York, you can find grants for older sculptors and painters. You can find grants for assistance to unwed mothers. You can find grants to assist sick musicians. You can find interest rate reductions for low to moderate people. In Texas, I found grants for assistance to cotton merchandising affiliates and families. So you know what I'm telling you is this. There are grants for everything. There are all kinds of grants out there. The hardest work that you will do is finding the grants and then finding, well, we'll go over that at the end. I'm going to tell you about how to find these grants and what to do. But let me tell you right now about Tori. Tori's in Virginia. She's a 42-year-old mother. She received $15,000 plus books and transportation to go back to school to finish her degree. She got a grant for education. There's Joan in Virginia. She was a bar manager, and she received over $25,000 to go back to school and is now a marketing director for a hot Internet company. She looks like she's a marketing director for a hot Internet company. And then there's Sherry. Uh, Sherry was in Mar is in Maryland, and she lost her job in telemarketing and received government money to start a monogram store in a shopping mall. I bet she's so glad she lost that stupid telemarketing child and causing people to hate her. <laughs> but now she's doing very well. And then how about James in Washington, D.C.? He received over $500,000 in government grant money to work on projects and travel overseas. Over half a million dollars is not bad. And then finally, how about Raymond in Washington, D.C.? At 68 years old, he received over $20,000 uh, 20, from the government to get a master's degree in vocational rehabilitation. 68 years old, and he was able to receive that money. So please don't let age be a factor. Don't let anything be a factor. Don't let anything be. You just grab this and run with it. Grab the information, expand on the information, and then do what I'm going to tell you at the end. Find these grant givers and go for it. I mean, it's, it's, it's there for you. It's certainly there for you. Urban Development Action Grants, you can build or rehab an office complex, you can build or rehab a shopping center, you can build or rehab an apartment complex, you can build attractive homes. Uh, Urban De Development Action Grants gives you approximately 28% of the money that you need, and a bank loan that you're going to get is going to be approximately 70%. So now you need another 2%. Where are you going to get it? You can go to CDBG and get that 2% as a grant if you're an investor. Come on. You can do this stuff. You can do this stuff. And it's wonderful stuff to do. There's a 1% inch, interest home loan. I promise that I talk about that. This is for modern income families. And you've got to be located in a rural area. You've got to have a population of less than 10,000 people. You gotta buy, you're going to buy with no money down. And the term is 32 years and 31 days. I have no idea where they got that 31 days from, but there it is. Self-help housing, this is a good one. Build a home to your own specifications. You've got to have moderate income level. You've got to buy and build with no money down. You're going to, well, you can buy and build with no money down. Uh, you're going to pay uh, closing costs and fire insurance, but watch this. You're going to sign a homeowner's contract to assist other people in the same geographic area using the same program to build. And so what happens is you help him to build his house, he comes around the corner and helps you to build your house when his is done. And so that's a self-help housing program. There's a senior citizen home improvement grant, grants to repair your house. If you're in a rural area, you can get this grant. Uh, you must have a population of less than 10000 and you can receive up to $7,500. No repayment required whatsoever. Some of our seniors live in some of the cold environments. And many times in the cold environment, the roof may spring a leak or the pipes may freeze up and explode. And so what we want to do is make sure that we can bail those people out with the kinds of funds that they need right away. How about a 1% interest home improvement loan? You've got to be located in a rural area. You've got to have a population less than 10,000. We've heard this before. But you don't have to be a senior citizen, not on this one. You can get up to $7,500, and the interest rate is only 1% interest, 1%. And the term can be up to 20 years. All right, there's a 3% interest loan. We're going to wrap this up in just a moment, and then I'm going to tell you how to get these programs. 
in this one, you have to be located in a targeted area. We talked about targeted areas. The interest rate is going to be about 3%. And if you're over 65, uh, 65 years old, there's zero interest. You pay zero interest on it. And it can be combined with other loans and grants. The maximum amount you're going to get is $32,500. $32, Here's one that is going to interest some of you. Some of you are going to start packing your bags and start to get your airplane ticket and head uh, toward the Sun Belt. Because we have a program called Sun Belt Housing. This is where you can own and operate rental property in exotic paradise locations, like Guam, like the Virgin Islands, like American Samoa, like the Northern Mariana Islands and the Pacific Islands. You will own and operate properties in the Sun Belt areas through this government program. There's money for low-cost housing. There's money for street improvements. Uh, new or expanding businesses, you can build apartment complexes or fix them up, shopping centers, and so much more. You see, what happens is that the government wants you to go and develop these areas because most of the times, these are areas that are undeveloped. They're in Sunbelt. They're a Sunbelt area, but they're undeveloped, underdeveloped. Typically, a half, the, uh, half of the money goes unused because nobody knows anything about it, and that's a shame, but that's what happens. All right, we're going to talk about small business, and then we're going to wrap it up and tell you how to get started. OK, Small Business Administration, we talked about just a moment ago. The purpose is to help you start, grow, and succeed in business. They're a business development assistance program. And with this program, you can get help for new and established businesses and owners. And, and what it's going to do is to help owners to improve their business skills. And so therefore, you're going to develop your business, and you're going to make your business run and become successful with their, uh, with their help. The SBA is going to provide workshops and management counseling, seminars, and other education to make you a good business person so you don't go under. And the applicants can be existing and potential small business people. So if you're thinking about starting a business or if you already have a business you want to expand, that's a program for you. Here's another one. Here is the ex, uh, Export Working Capital Program. And in this program, if you want to be an, uh, an exporter, this program will guarantee up to 90% of a secured loan or $75,000, $750,000, whichever is less. The loan maturity can be up to three years with annual renewals, and the applicants have to be export ready. So you've got to go ready now. Now here's a one, another one that I'm going to share with you. This is one for women, and this is Women's Business Ownership Assistance. And the purpose of this was to remove discrimination and address concerns of women uh, that own small businesses. They'll never uh, completely eliminate discrimination, but at least it goes a long way to help. Uh, you can get financial assistance in the form of grants provided by nonprofit organizations, and the cooperative agreements are usually going to be limited to one year. All right, so all these are great government programs. They're wonderful. How do we get a grant? Well, this is where I want you to uh, for, forge your commitment. Forge your commitment here. The first thing I want you to do is to define your project. If you have a hobby and you want to turn it into a, uh, if you want to get a grant and turn it into a business, then define that hobby and define it in business terms. Define it in a way where the public can see um, what that ho how that hobby is going to benefit them. And then what I want you to do is to identify the funding sources. All the funding sources that will that are in a position to help you to get that hobby turned into a business. The funding sources will be interested in whatever that hobby is because it fits with their, uh, grant, um, with, with their grant purpose, the purpose of their grants. So that's the way you're going to find your funding sources. Then you make that initial contact. When you make that initial contact, it's going to be important to uh, talk to the right people. We'll talk about the right person in just a moment and how that right person can help you tremendously. Uh, you then will acquire the proposal guidelines. All of these funders have guidelines. They have grant guidelines. You want to find out what the guidelines are, they will send you a copy of them. Have them email or fax it to you. Determine and identify any personnel needs that you might have. Um, if you're a one-person show, you may find yourself expanding rather quickly, and that's a good thing. Then you're going to form a timeline. You're going to keep that timeline updated. Uh, because the grant source is going to want to know how you're doing with the timeline, what's going on, how much progress are you making. And so that way, you can keep your grant source updated as to what your timeline is and what your progress is. Also, 
make that initial contact. And when you make that initial contact, you're going to identify the project officer, the project officer. So you have a grant source, a funding source. Within that funding source, you call in and you write and you identify the project officer. And ask that project officer about any particular a draft proposal reviews, because what happens is that when you uh, write the grant for that particular project to that project officer, you're going to go by their grant giving uh, guidelines, and then you're going to ask about the draft proposal review. They will actually review a draft of your grant proposal, and as they review the draft, they're going to come up with different things that can help you to get your grant your your grant accepted. And so they may tell you, well, you know, this particular grant, they don't want to give it for this, but they will give it for that. And so I would change this and make it this way instead of that way. And that way you get word from the horse's mouth as to what your, uh, how your grant should be, what that draft should look like. So they'll review it, and they'll get back with you on the changes to the review. Then the next thing that you want to do is in inquire about any budget requirements. Sometimes there are budget requirements. Uh, sometimes there may not be. But that should be part of your timeline, and that should that should flow right along with your timeline. And then, of course, the final thing is to submit and ask for the money. You never get it unless you ask for it, and that's what this is all about. So hopefully, I have given you enough food for thought to maybe dispel any fears that you might have that, oh, the grant programs are not alive and kicking anymore. Now, I can't get money through the government. Well, not only government will you get money from, but you also get money through a nonprofit. You get money through corporations. You get money through uh, public and private foundations as well. So there's a host of different grant or find, uh, funding sources out there for you to get your uh, project uh, completed. And so hopefully you've gotten a little bit more information about it. Hopefully you have become motivated. And you will get off the couch, put the remote control down, and uh, go after these grants. So folks, this is what I had for you today. I wanted to share this with you. Um, I want to also let you know that if you have questions about this particular webinar, about grants or anything like that, I want you to get hold of me. My office number is 626-733-7762. That's my office, 626. 733-7762. So you can give us a call or you can email me at Reggie at ReggieBrooks.com. That's Reggie at ReggieBrooks.com. Uh, shoot me a question, and if I can answer that question for you, I'll do it right away. If I need to research it, it might take a minute or so for me to get back with you, but I will certainly get back with you. All right, I have enjoyed this. I have been a motor mouth for the last hour and a half, and I realize it but I had a lot of information to give you and a short time to give it to you in. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you take it and run with it, and I will see you on the next seminar. Good night, everybody.